Well, by now, many of us know about the classic story of Lex Luger main eventing SummerSlam 1993 against Yokozuna. With his back against the wall, his only championship matchup, Lex Luger somehow defies the odds and wins the matchup, albeit by count out, therefore he doesn't win the championship, but still there's that big empty celebration at the end with all the balloons and the music and the confetti and whatnot. But don't forget, folks, there's a whole other show to talk about besides the main event, and that's why we're here this week talking about SummerSlam 1993. From August 30th, 30 years ago, the day this video comes out, from the Palace at Auburn Hills, Michigan, aka Suburban Detroit. This show was nominated by Alexi Wasson and Adam Vanderplum over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. The show opens up with the Lex Express pulling into town, making its final stop in its big multi town tour of America, that big call to action campaign, reminding people hey, Lex Luger's a good guy now. 23,000 folks packed the Palace on this Monday night event, 250,000 pay-per-view buys. It's down a bit from the previous years, but not nearly as bad as 1995. Vince McMahon and Bobby Heenan are on the call here, and your opening matchup sees the million dollar man Ted DiBiase take on the bad guy turned good guy, Razor Ramon. That's right, Razor has turned babyface in the wake of his little program, uh, no pun intended, with the one, two, three kid. Of course, there was that famous upset on Monday Night Raw, the match that really put the kid on the map, and then it was Razor's obsession with trying to get the rematch with the 123 kid, even putting up a reward, a cash bonus, should the kid wrestle him. The kid fights him, he steals the money, so he's fooled again. Money Inc. busting Razor's balls for a few weeks about that one. Razor responding, though, by helping the kid beat DiBiase in a match, which is what leads to this one here. Ted jumping Razor at the onset, but Ramon shaking him off. He's off to a good start. He's got Ted begging off, but DiBiase outsmarts him and takes over, working him over. He's got the chin lock applied. Razor tries to fight back, but Ted remaining in control here. He goes to the million dollar dream, but Ramon creating some space at the last minute. Razor getting dumped outside while Ted takes off the turnbuckle pad, goes to drive Razor into it, but it immediately backfires. Razor's edge with some huge hang time and the win. I give it two stars out of five. I think DiBiase did a good job, you know, playing his role as kind of that heel gatekeeper at this point in his career. He did a good job of it with the one, two, three kid on television. He does a good job here with Razor, who's still relatively fresh as a good guy. So I think this match was a really good platform for Razor to get over more so as a baby face. And this would be DiBiase's final appearance in the Federation for a good while. He left the company because he wanted to be uh, more at home to deal with his marital problems. It eventually led to him becoming a born-again Christian, but this was the end of DiBiase's first run of the Federation. Todd Pettengill at ringside with Mama Steiner and Sister Steiner. Todd tries to do a little banter, but Mama Steiner's not having any of it. We're always telling him, no Frankensteiners by my good lamps. Whatever you say, sounds good. Sister Steiner also forgets it's a work and calls Rick by his real name of Rob. They're interrupted by James E. Cornette, who's wearing a neck brace for Smoky Mountain reasons, as he welcomes Dr. Tom Pritchard and Jimmy Del Rey, the heavenly bodies, to the ring. Cornette recently debuted for the Federation representing SMW, and he's brought the Heavenly Bodies with him to challenge Rick and Scott, the Steiner brothers, for the WWF Tag Team titles. The Steiners with the big hometown hero treatment here, wearing the Michigan colors on their singlets. The bodies dump the Steiners before they can take off their Letterman jackets. Rick is practically dumped on his head. Scott re-enters the ring, and the two brothers totally clean house. At one point on commentary, he then gives the purported address of where the Steiners grew up. He visited their childhood home today, and he he says what the address is, and so out of curiosity, I looked it up, and at this point, Google Maps tells me it's a vacant lot. I'm sure whatever he had meant to get across in that joke was very clever 30 years ago. The bodies are getting bodied in the early going, but there is a nice little misdirection into a double team move that's got Scott taken down. Del Rey with a rolling senton off the apron onto Scott. Bobby Heenan called it a moonsault. Gigolo with the float over DDT, really pulling off a bunch of moves that were kind of ahead of their time here. Cornette even follows up with a tennis racket attack. Jimmy trying another float over DDT, but it's blocked and countered into a suplex. Hot tag to Rick who unloads on his opponent. Heenan with the light of the night saying, Mrs. Steiner just gave her daughter a clothesline. Del Rey is power slammed. The referee is distracted. Tennis racket shot across Rick's back, but we get a kick out. Del Rey goes for his moonsault, but hits his own partner instead. He's hit with the Frankensteiner. Scott and Rick win and retain. I give this one three and a half stars out of five. This was a fun matchup here. I think the hometown hero advantage 
advantage for the Steiners really played into how alive the crowd felt for this one. I think that uh, these two teams stylistically worked very well. You know, I haven't seen a whole bunch of Heavenly Bodies stuff, but I am really blown away by what Dr. Tom and Gigolo Jimmy Del Rey uh, have uh, in these matches that I've seen so far. I mean, like I said, Jimmy's doing stuff that are uh, moves that are kind of par for the course today and much more traditionally associated with cruiserweights and stuff. And, and Del Rey's busting these things out uh, pretty commonly in his matches, which is pretty fun to see. But yeah, that and the athleticism of the Steiners in their relative prime is also just really entertaining. Well, 1993 is really the end of an era in a lot of ways for the World Wrestling Federation. Not only did Hulk Hogan leave the company earlier in the year after King of the Ring and the International Tour, but also Mean Gene Okerlund is on his way out of the company. SummerSlam will be the final night for this legendary voice of wrestling. A few weeks before this, the Federation hired a newcomer, Joe Fowler, to be his eventual successor, but don't get used to him because he's gone soon after this show here. But he debuts interviewing Intercontinental Champion Shawn Michaels with his bodyguard, Diesel. Can he hold on against Mr. Perfect? Michaels says he'll prove to everyone that he's the greatest Intercontinental Champion. Fowler pointing out that Diesel helped Shawn regain the title, but Shawn says since he's the one wearing it, he must have won it. In that next matchup for the Intercontinental Belt, Shawn Michaels defends against Mr. Perfect, who's going for the three-peat tonight. We see a shot of Jim Ross and Gorilla Monsoon on the call for the show at Radio WWF. Bit of a miscommunication early on between the two, but they do recover, and Perfect's on top for the moment. It's a very fun first few minutes here. Shawn's flying all over the place, goes off the top rope, and gets arm dragged. He goes for a drop kick, but Perfect slingshots him out of the ring instead. Diesel will be creeping, and that distraction allows for Michaels to hit his super Super kick and take over. Sean working over that previously injured back. Perfect lets out a damn it. Oh, oh damn it. Perfect picking up steam as he hits the ropes. It's a big drop kick. Coming back with a vengeance here. The backslide attempt is countered, then countered still into a perfect plex. Diesel yoinks perfect out of the pinfall. We get total chaos on the outside. The referee is tripped up like an idiot, which allows Diesel to throw perfect into the ring post. Hebner recovers and counts perfect out for Michaels to retain. Perfect jumps them after the bell, but it gets him double teamed by the champ and his bodyguard. Pettengill interviewing Sean on the ramp, telling him he can't feel too good about winning that way, but Sean just reiterates that he has the belt, therefore he is the best. Perfect's back up and runs to the back after them. Three stars out of five for me on this one. First time in SummerSlam history that the Intercontinental title had not changed hands. I thought these two, you know, just you look at this match on paper and it plays out pretty much how you expected it to happen in real life. Those two have amazing chemistry and they worked really well with each other. I think the way that Sean and Perfect, they're kind of, you know, very similar in the sense of how they put their opponents over and how they sell for their opponents. So to have these two big sellers working on for each other, I thought was great stuff. Kind of disappointing of the count out loss, especially when you consider how the main event is going to end here, but uh, be that as it may, I still think it was a good match. Backstage with Joe Fowler again interviewing the 123 Kid. Joe admits that he's nervous making his SummerSlam debut. How about the kid? He says he's very nervous. He can barely speak, so let's keep this interview going. Even though he has the size disadvantage, he says he's going to give it 110% against IRS. He's quiet. He's shy, but he's a hero. Like I mentioned earlier, Razor Ramon's babyface turn really began after that lost to the 123 Kid, and that's kind of how we got that feud with Money Inc. getting involved with Razor's stuff. And now we're seeing the other half of that equation as IRS, who's already in the ring, not a great sign, taking on the 123 Kid, making his pay-per-view debut. Fast to start things out, but he's cut off and thrown around by the bigger shyster, launching him up again, but Kid drop kicks him. Look at the height. IRS is back on him, just keeping him out of the ring, but Kid almost pulls off another miracle. IRS, the abdominal stretch, rope assist, Kid comes back from a chin lock, he's fighting back big, goes to the top rope, there's an edit for some reason, then Kid hits the top rope moonsault, I wonder what happened there. IRS eventually lays Kid out with a big clothesline and beats him, well, so much for no entrance, no victory. Then afterward, Heenan wants to use his brain scan telestrator and he just scribbles a 1040 on the screen mid move, saying that IRS wrote the kid off. This match gets two and a half stars out of five for me. Pretty solid showing here by one, two, three, Kid, still obviously, you know, proving that he's got what it takes to kind of hang with the older, larger individuals in the WWF. Because, guys, it's crazy to think of how young Sean Waltman is here and how much more he has left to go in his career and left to give both in WWF and WCW. It's pretty crazy to see those humble beginnings here on display. But, yeah, I think that the match with he and Shyster was good, really well executed, and it makes sense that kid doesn't win this one because he can't be winning miracles all the time. The Todds are at ringside with Bruce and Owen Hart, the brothers 
pictures of Brett. Hey, where are Stu and Helen at? They say Stu's recovering from knee surgery after what happened with he and Jerry Lawler a couple of weeks ago, and they're here to offer their support. Sweet mullet, Owen. Now it's time for the big grudge match. Who is the undisputed king of the World Wrestling Federation? We're going to find out as the king of Memphis, Jerry Lawler, takes on this year's king of the ring in Brett the Hitman Hart. That's what happened back in July. Brett won that tournament only to be attacked by Lawler at the end of the show. Jerry has spent weeks tormenting Hart, berating his parents, getting an Elvis impersonator to talk trash about him and so forth. It's finally time for the match now though and Lawler is suddenly coming out in crutches. Lawler says he was really looking forward to the match tonight since he hates Brett and his family so much, but then he describes this horrific story of his rental car's brakes not working, a little old lady pulled out in front of him causing a 10 car pileup. His knee was torn up and mangled, but by the grace of God, he was going to make it to the palace. The doctors allegedly say that Lawler's in no shape to compete, so the king has picked his own hand-picked court jester. It's only Doink the Clown. He's got a pair of buckets in his hands. He throws some confetti at the kids with one of them, then throws a bucket of water at Bruce Hart and only Bruce Hart as the result of a rib. That's got Bruce really enraged. Now the match with Brett and Doink officially begins. Heenan is weeping as he talks about Lawler's inspiring story of survival and heroism as this match begins. Hart's able to get the advantage of Doink early on. He's begging for Lawler to get in, chasing after him and so forth. On the ramp, Doink jumping on Brett while he's distracted, working over the leg. The angle on Lawler's shot at ringside is getting lower and lower as the match goes on. It's really creepy. The referee calling things right down the middle, daddy. Doink with the stump puller goes for the whoopee cushion but gets a groin full of knees instead. Brett hits his signature setup moves, locks in the sharpshooter. Suddenly Lawler gets up, enters the ring, and cracks Hart over the back with his crutch. It's a miracle! Owen and Bruce live it on the outside, but they're held back as the beating continues. Jerry and Doink make their way to the back when President Jack Tunney shows up. He tells Lawler he must go back to the ring and wrestle Hart or he'll be banned from the Federation for life. Brett meets Jerry on the ramp, fights him back to the ring. Brett just beating the bejesus out of Lawler here, hitting it with a crutch on the outside, but Jerry cheats right back while the referee has his back turned. Lawler giving Brett ring post-itis. Using the crutch again as referee Bill Alfonso is mesmerized by Owen Hart's leather pants and matching skinny tie. Brett takes Jerry to Dick Kick City and puts the straps down. He beats up King some more, hits the pile driver, and like a true king, offering the thumbs up and pulls the audience, locks in the sharpshooter. Lawler submits for Brett to win, or does he? Brett refuses to let go of the hold because of his hatred for Jerry. The refs are begging him to let go. Danny Davis making a personal appeal. Remember the Hart Foundation, Brett. You have to let go. The fans and the Hart brothers are absolutely giddy over this. By this point, 10 officials have entered the ring to try and convince Brett to let go. Finally, it takes Owen and Bruce to get him to relinquish the hold. The referee reverses the original decision due to Brett not letting go, making Jerry Lawler the undisputed king of the WWF. I'm going to lump the whole Bret Hart saga with Doink and Jerry Lawler into one segment here and just say the whole segment's four stars. I really love the storytelling uh, in this feud. I mean, the bitter rivalry with Bret and Lawler that, that really started at King of the Ring and lasted for a very long time, not entirely by their own choice, mind you, but it was a very long-standing rivalry and I think Bret and Lawler were great foils for each other. And Lawler being the chicken shit heel, trying to get out of it because of an injury, having someone else do his dirty work, still losing the match but is able to somehow weasel away with a victory on a technicality because Brett hated him so much. What a well done story. And something that I actually learned doing some research for this was that Brett actually put a little extra stank on the sharpshooter and really tried to you know, shoot on him a little bit and put more pressure on that hold as revenge for Lawler apparently being snug with Brett in the beatdown at King of the Ring. Ludwig Borga has got some words to say about Detroit. He says America is crumbling like how this building behind him is crumbling and can't believe Lex Luger would fight so hard for a dump such as this. On we go now to see Ludwig Borga, who's been unbeaten in the Federation since arriving a couple of months ago, taking on Marty Jannetty. Borga, the man from Finland, putting the boots to party Marty from the get-go. Jannetty starts to fight back, but he's soon cut off by Borga. Bear hug, but Marty fights out of it. He's unable to capitalize though, and he gets laid out. This continues until Borga puts the torture rack on Janetti to win in decisive fashion. 
I give it a half star out of five. I'm not sure why you would put a squash match like this on a pay-per-view, but I still think it did a good job at putting Borga over as this big beast. Marty did a good job. I like the fact they gave him a couple of hope spots in this thing and didn't make it a total squash -aroo. I was also very shocked that this was Ludwig Borga's like early finisher was the torture rack. Surprised me because they told Lexi couldn't use the torture rack. They gave him the running forearm and they give the move to somebody else while Lex is still there. I couldn't believe that. I know that Lex and Ludwig would have like a program later on because of the whole rah rah USA versus anti America thing. But I, to my knowledge, I'm not sure the torture rack ever comes up in conversation as, oh, you stole my finisher. It's time for the dramatic follow up to the epic encounter from WrestleMania 9, a rest in peace match as The Undertaker battles the giant Gonzalez. What are the rules of a rest in peace match? We never fully know what they are, even as the match begins. All we know is that there's no count out, no disqualifications, and there must be a decisive winner. The big man comes out with Harvey Whippleman, who's carrying the urn that he and Mr. Hughes stole from Taker months ago. Taker strikes first, but Harvey is quick to distract, allowing Gonzalez to hit some slow motion clubbing blows. Slow mo club lows. Taker throws the lariats. Gonzalez is shaken for a moment, but the giant grabs a chair on the outside and clatters Taker with it, throwing him into the steps. More very slow attacks by the giant, but partway through we hear the gong and suddenly we see Paul Bear making his way to the ring for the first time in ages with a black wreath. We'd been seeing the wreath mysteriously placed at ringside during some matches the last few weeks. Whippleman takes offense to Bearer's presence and goes for him. Bearer just checks him and is finally reunited with the urn. What a moment for the big man there. Taker regains his power, hits some clotheslines. El he wobbly in full effect. Gonzalez finally takes a knee. The Undertaker goes up top. The flying lariat sends both men crashing down. The cover and the win by by the Undertaker. Vince saying on commentary, now we know what a rest in peace match is. Like, yeah, I guess it's a, it's a no disqualification match. Woo! After the match, Gonzalez wants to know what happened to the urn. He angrily grabs Harvey and gives him one of the worst choke slams I've ever seen. One star out of five for me. Great for the moment of Bear getting reunited with the urn. That was some tremendous performance there by Paul Bear. Um, good to see this storyline come to a conclusion. But yeah, the match itself was pretty boring. And uh, Gonzalez would not be much longer for the Federation. He would be on TV a little bit after this, but it was definitely the end of the Undertaker Gonzalez feud at least and we can all be thankful for that. Joe Fowler backstage with Jim Cornette, Mr. Fuji and the champ Yokozuna. Cornette claiming that a biased official caused the heavenly bodies to lose earlier in the night but he turns his attention to Lex Luger and Yokozuna. He tells Luger to draw all of his strength from the millions of Americans who he met on his big tour but it will not be enough to take down the monster from Japan. Six-man tag matchup next as the Smoking Guns and Tatanka take on the Head Shrinkers and Bam Bam Bigelow. Man, Dark Side of the Ring Season 4 getting a lot of coverage on this show. The match begins and the heels immediately lay out the faces. Bam Bam and Tatanka collide in midair, both thinking crossbody. Billy Gunn tags in and goes wild on Fatu, but he is run over then dropped on the top rope. In comes Michael Barton, who starts taking all the heat. Bar just gets knocked around for several minutes, takes a big double elbow from the baddies. He manages to recover and tag into Tonka though, who's going nuts. Big House of Fire, he finally scoops a Bigelow for a big old slam. Hits the DDT, but he's laid out as he goes for the warpath. Samu with a diving headbutt. Triple teaming on Tonks, the dreaded triple headbutt, followed by a three post massacre attempt, but they miss. The babies pull the heels out of the ring, Tonka rolling up Samu for the win. I give it two and a half stars out of five. This was a solid mid-card tag team match, which I think did its exact purpose to perfection, basically being that buffer between the Undertaker-Gonzalez match and the big uh, championship match coming up right after this and gonna get the fans to wake up again. Joe Fowler again, this time with the driver of the Lex Express. He's watching SummerSlam on a tiny black and white screen of the bus. Nice. Dude's got nothing but nice things to say about Lex, not as a wrestler, but as a person. Toss over to Todd Pettengill standing next to an appropriately dressed fan from Why Not? Wearing a bedspread? Why not? It's time now for the Japanese national anthem. The crowd is all over this poor guy who sadly can't sing worth a lick. Oh! Yeah. 
But enough of that, out comes the macho master of ceremonies, the macho man Randy Savage, alongside singing sensation Aaron Neville. I don't know much, but I know he sings a mean national anthem. You know, when you think about it, this was one of the earliest shots fired in the whole war between the WWF and WCW, because Aaron Neville shows up here singing the national anthem for SummerSlam 93. He's doing it one year later at Spring Stampede 94. On we go now to the main event of main events. For the WWF Championship, the beast from Japan, Yokozuna, defends against the All-American Lex Luger. You know this story, folks. The body slam heard around the world on July 4th on the USS Intrepid. Lex Luger staking his claim as the next man to challenge Yoko for the belt. We get the Lex Express and the multi-week tour across the country where Lex went from city to city, from sea to shining sea on his big silver bus. If you want to hear more about the Lex Express and everything around that, you can check out my review of Lex Luger, the WWF, right here. Jim Cornette was added to the Yokozuna camp as the U.S. spokesman. He inserts some clauses in the title match contract, saying not only does Lex's bionic forearm need to be covered and padded, but it's also Lex's one and only chance he'll get at the title versus Yokozuna. One of my favorite parts in the build for this matchup here is on the final episode of Superstars, the go-home segment, you have Cornette and uh, Yokozuna and Fuji. Cornette's cutting this big bombastic promo on account of Yokozuna and the babyface rebuttal to this one is the whole locker room just comes out surrounding the ring waving tiny American flags. No, not John Philip Sousa, anything but that. Coming to blows from the get-go, Luger can't take Yoko off his feet. The big man goes to the leg drop but misses. Lex avoids another Yokozuna attack, wearing down the champion. Yoko comes back on offense, distracting the referee. Mr. Fuji looking to season Luger with some salt, but Lex blocks it. Lex goes for a body slam, but he can't get him up this time, and he's kicked down. On the outside, Yoko really laying it in, choking Lex, squashing him in the ring post. These guys sure are spending a lot of time on the outside, aren't they? Wonder why they're not counting him. Axe handle from the second, axe handle from the top. Luger with a top rope forearm, still not enough. There's a big collision and a double down in the ring. Cornette on the apron, and Yokozuna dinks Lex with a ceremonial bucket, but we still get a kick out. Yoko continues to pour on the pressure. All looks bleak. Luger keeps kicking out. After a while, it gets kind of worrisome because with every subsequent kick out, the crowd gets quieter and quieter when really it should be the opposite thing happening. So for a minute, I thought they were going to lose the crowd. Yoko applies a shoulder claw. The USA chants do pick back up here. Lex comes up to his feet, goes for another slam, but he can't do it. Yokozuna setting up for the bonsai drop, but Luger moves. Luger makes a comeback, dodging the avalanche attack, hitting the body slam on the champ. He decks Mr. Fuji on the apron, pulls down his forearm padding, Dex Yokozuna can't get the pad back up. Luger wins by count out. We get that big celebration. The American flag, the balloons, the Steiners and Tatanka and Randy Savage all celebrating. But guess what? He's still not the champion because it was a count out victory. Vincent Mann saying, you can bet that Lex Luger will get his rematch. Yeah, well, it's going to come with some caveats, won't it? I give this main event match three stars out of five. I will say this, that up until the ending, this match was pretty darn good. They had a great story told here. Lex Luger defying all these odds and fighting back over and over again from Cornette and from Fuji and from Yokozuna's cheating ways. Like that was all really expertly done. And I think that had they pulled the trigger on this and let Luger win decisively with a pinfall to become the new champion, we'd be saying a very different story about this match this storyline, this entire show. It would be a very different trajectory for the company as we know it, I think, but we'd have a whole different outlook on this match because, again, all that pomp and circumstance for Luger winning the match by count out took all of the energy out of it. It just made it feel so hollow and so like, why are we celebrating what's ultimately this kind of mediocre showing? Like you beat Yokozuna, but it's so like, it's so not, a real win, you know? It's not a decisive win like fans wanted. Like fans were practically promised and guaranteed, you know? I'm not saying that every single show has got to end with a good guy getting over, but with a story that feels as slam dunk as this, when you're really trying to get like a new hero, so to speak, uh, to, to be there and, and to be that new Hulk Hogan, 
uh, you know, how much time do they really have to spend on that? You know, you could have justified building Luger a bit longer, but the longer they did that, the more the interest in Luger waned, and that was, you know, timing coincided with Bret Hart getting even more popular. So they were forced to make a choice, a difficult choice, come the turn to 1994. But they had the opportunity here to let Lex win, and I think it could have been a very different story. I think fans were willing and they were ready to embrace Lex as that main event guy, but this really derailed it. This Lex Express, the wheels came off pretty fast after this, and it was gonna be hard for Luger to regain the full interest of the fans and the belief and the passion that he could beat Yokozuna. That being said, my grade for SummerSlam 1993 is a C plus. This one's kind of a tough one for me to grade. I was on the bubble between this and a B minus because I think that a lot of the undercard, the mid card matches delivered, barring one or two of them. But I still think that, you know, sometimes the main event and how it goes down can really have an effect on the entire show for good and for bad. And this was such a catastrophic misfire to have Luger win the way he did, that empty victory. Uh, and I think that puts a damper on the whole show. It's like people remember SummerSlam 93 primarily for that. And so and to me, it does kind of bring the whole show down in spite of some pretty solid mid-card work. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look back at SummerSlam 93 30 years later. Give the video a thumbs up if you like it. Be sure to leave a comment what you thought about it below. Subscribe to Wrestling With Regret. Hit that bell icon to get all the notifications. Well, you know what? SummerSlam is now officially in the rear view mirror here on the channel. Earlier this year, we had ourselves some Hulkamania, but I think it's now time for a little bit of Sting Timber. And to celebrate that, we are going into our next classic pay-per-view review with another trip to Clash of the Champions. The first Clash of the Champions, Flair versus Sting for the NWA World Heavyweight Championship. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.